good evening, everybody. Uh, we're just waiting for everybody to uh, join our virtual uh, lecture. So if you just give us a, a few moments and then we'll we'll start in around about uh, 30 seconds. Thanks very much. Tim, if I can just check with you, is everybody on board? Can we start? You are, you are good to go, Richard. Thanks very much indeed. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to the 2020 Worshipful Company of Plumbers Autumn Lecture. Uh, I'm Richard Soper, and uh, I'll be talking you through the first, uh, per first part of the evening. And um, firstly, may I just say, uh, as I said, a very warm welcome to you all um, from wherever you are. And I want to give, obviously, a very special thanks to our guest speakers with uh, Julie Spinks and Yvonne Orgill. Uh, but I'm going to give also a few more um, thanks. Uh, uh, Tim, if you can move to the next slide, please. At the start, please. Particularly a big uh, thank you, if I may, to the corporate members and their sponsorship. You saw them on the first slide uh, for all the things that they do uh, for our livery. Uh, I want to thank in particular also Tim Sainty, who you can see at the moment, maybe just by a CIPHE label. He's in the background, he's been, he's hosting this evening, uh, but also did done a, an amazing amount of work to get us where we are. Uh, plus, of course, I want to be, do a big thank you to yourselves for, give, for giving us uh, your time to be part of our virtual lecture, our first virtual lecture. Uh, and so uh, for us, it's very exciting. We've got over 400 registrations. Uh, of which over 10% are from uh, international ground. So can I say thank you very much indeed. Before we start, there is a little bit of housekeeping, if I may. This is a CPD event, uh, so on request, we can supply the, the necessary forms. We are recording this because it will be uh, put onto uh, not only the website of the Wishful Company, it will also be on various other partners and associations who support the Wishful Company of Plumbers. Uh, there are chat and questions you'll see either in the middle or the top right hand corner. So please, as we go through our two guest speakers, would you please put your questions up? And also we've arranged for some pop up polls uh, via Julie and Yvonne. And when they when they set them up, we'll be stopping for 20 to 30 seconds to obviously gather that uh, gather that information. So thanks very much for that. Just a little bit about uh, the Worshipful Company of Plumbers, if I may. Uh, to talk particularly about our aims and objectives, uh, focusing particularly in our craft and also, of course, into our charity. Um, we have been, as you can read, we've been going for just over 650 years. Uh, so uh, we've, we've worn time well. And our focus particularly is, is encouraging excellence in plumbing, uh, supporting and pr promotion of that history but also supporting recognised individuals, organisations and institutions in the excellence of plumbing standards, education, and as it says, technical development. And I thank those who are joining tonight who are a very active part within our livery. So uh, again, a big warm welcome to our livery this evening and other liveries who are joining us from around the UK. Plus, of course, this influencing that we're very much in raising the profile of uh, key uh, plumbing developments, and relating, of course, to safety and public health. And particularly tonight, we're going to be looking particularly at sustainability and water conversation with Julie and with um, Yvonne. The charity, of course, that's what we're all about. We're very proud uh, to be um, that part that we're actually trying to uh, bring funding in to support things like bursaries and awards to uh, encourage uh, excellence in our education. And a big thank you to Monument Tools, who in fact uh, sponsor our bursary uh, programme, which we will be announcing over the coming weeks. Therefore, uh, thanks very much. We're very proud of our livery and uh, uh, I've been in the livery myself for a number of years and, uh, and enjoying it very much and supporting the aims and objectives. So if we could move to the agenda, uh, please, I would appreciate it. And as you can see now, we're moving into the main part of the uh, evening and that is the uh, 
two presentations by Julie and Yvonne. We're going to start in really reflecting back in what was on the invitation in how we are, sorry, how we have reached where we are today, today's activities already underway, and how much is still to be done to protect an essential finite resource. So our first speaker is Julie Spinks, uh, Managing Director of the, as you can see, the Water Regulatory Advisory Scheme. Uh, Julie uh, Spinks joined RAS in uh, 2011, a founding member of WaterSafe, which we're all well aware of. Uh, previously, Julie had 18 years experience in the water industry. Um, and this uh, included 70 years with the uh, United Utilities in various roles in the water supply and wastewater operations before becoming involved in investment planning and asset management, culminating as director of uh, wastewater asset management. She's a graduate in biological science as an MBA and is a chartered director and very importantly, a liveryman of our worshipful company of plumbers. Julie, uh, may I give you the stage? Thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh and I can see Tim's just bringing out the slide. I think that was maybe just a slight typo. I didn't spend 70 years with United Utilities. You probably all think I've got a portrait <laughs> of the attic right now, <laughs> which I think would be fantastic. I am absolutely delighted to be here. Thanks very much uh, for inviting me and for everybody taking uh, some time out of your evening to come. That's really great. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about using less water or perhaps wasting less water. So if we move on to the next slide, what am I gonna talk about? Well, I thought it'd be really good to start with why should we bother at all? So I think it's always great to say, why bother? Then perhaps it's just useful in terms of examining this question to think, well, how do we actually use water? And I'm gonna focus particularly in, in the home. And what are the options for how we could save water and waste less? What's been DEFRA proposing? They did a consultation in 2019, where's that, where's that up to? And then I'm gonna spend a bit more time specifically thinking about the water fittings uh, regulations and bylaws in Scotland and how they can help, because that's particularly where RAS has its field of expertise. So thinking about water and that, that why question. Well, first of all, water is quite a scarce resource. There's quite a lot of water on our blue planet. It's all over the place, but only 3% of that is fresh water. Um, and because of the polar ice caps and where the water is kept, actually there's less than 1% that's available for human use. So it's probably not quite as prevalent as we think it is. So moving on to that next slide, um, the, the first key reason is actually we could run out of water. Um, and the picture I've got here is something that James Bevin described as those diagrams that are the jaws of death. And I've borrowed the data from Thames Water Management Plan. And what he talked about with the jaws of death uh, is that bit where you can see that in uh, uh, orange there, we've got the demand for water going up over time and just in the Thames, and this is in the, the London area, and the blue is showing the water is available for use. And that jaws of death was actually where they cross over and you run out of water. Quite worryingly, you can see if Thames water did nothing, they don't have enough water even, even today. And there are lots of areas around the country that are struggling with those types of issues. So, it's predicted that by 2015, so if you can just go back to him, um, England is, England's population is supposed to grow by about 10 million and we're supposed to have hotter weather. Um, and actually thinking about maintaining our current resilience, um, it's predicted that we'd need 3,300 3, 3, 3, million litres per day extra capacity to help that population. So we definitely could run out of water. The second key reason, moving on to the next slide, is actually it's damaging for the environment. The, the picture behind this screen is actually a beautiful chalk stream, which is a very diverse environment. And I've, I can't help but quote James Bevan again. And he says, we need water wastage to be as socially unacceptable as blowing smoke into the face of baby or throwing your plastic bags into the sea. I mean, that's quite emotive language. Um, and we know from the Environment Agency that water abstraction has to reduce by something like 700 million litres to address environmental problems. So one, we could run out of water. Two, it's damaging for the environment. And thirdly, um, if we move on, why it's just costing us money um, for the water and for the energy. And a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, money is tied up actually just in our energy bills. So 20% of energy bills is used to heat the water. Also, just thinking about leaky loos, which has been quite topical, a leaky toilet wastes somewhere between 215 and 400 litres of clean uh, drinking water on average 
every day and that seems quite a lot and we'll start thinking about how much we use but it's probably one or two extra people in your home every day if you have a leaky loo so if we just move on to the next slide let's ask and, and start with our first poll so we want this to be interactive how much do you think uh each an average person in the uk uses so uh tim if you can do that first poll it should be coming up on your screen now Great. So all you need to do is click your option and uh, press the submit button. So it's great as a speaker, it comes up for me as well. And we're just going to pause um, and give you a bit of chance uh, to answer that question. Hopefully you can find the poll and that's come up for everybody as well. Um, and in true uh, Blue Peter uh, style, we'll, uh, I have a poll that we prepared earlier with some consumers. It'll be quite interesting. I, I'm predicting that you're a much more learned group. Um, and that you might do fare better than the 2,000 consumers that we asked. So we're just pausing for those results to come back. Great, so they're back, so well, it's, I'm seeing this at the same time as you. So actually, I can definitely tell that this group knows a lot more than everyone. You can see that the most popular results were 131 to 140 litres and 141 to 150 uh, litres. Quite a few of you thought that we used quite uh, less, and some of you thought that you used quite a bit more. So that's really kind of interesting. So if we just uh, close those results, and if I move on to the next slide, you can see when we ask consumers much more generally, so Tim, if you can just move the slide on, perfect, that actually you can see the answer is between roughly 143 and 150 litres if we just look at the UK. Um, and at about just less than 3% of 2000 consumers got that right. So that's 97% of people who don't actually know how much water that we use. So this is great. You're obviously a much more informed group. So if we move on then to the next slide, uh, this is some information that I borrowed from Acquia who did some fabulous research. And they looked at the household microponents uh, of use. And let's just pay attention to where people are using water. So 28% is from the tap, 24% from the toilet. Then we've got 21% for the shower and then the washing machine bit on the baths and, and dishwashers. The bit that I'm really paying attention, so I'm quite interested in the water fittings and the plumbings and pipes and fittings. It's quite a lot to do with the actual, um, uh, the, the actual water fittings themselves. So that information might be quite useful. So if we just move on to the next slide, I've sort of posed this question really is, well, how is that pandemic affecting water use? So I think chatting to water companies, the feedback that I've got, is that, well, not surprisingly, people are using more in homes rather than at businesses. So quite a lot of us are home working uh, at the moment. And that means that demand habits have changed. So because we've not got that daily commute for all of us, we might be having a shower a bit later or, or just differently. So there's a notice that demand habits have particularly changed. And indeed, some, there's some higher demand for um, hygiene, manage, uh, hygiene measures, you might imagine as we're sort of washing our hands more frequently. But certainly the highest demand uh, has been associated with hot weather. I think the thing that's a real concern uh, over consumers' ability to pay, so obviously we're entering an economic uh, recession now in the UK. Lots of people are really suffering in terms of being furloughed or having lost their jobs. And actually affordability is a, is a big issue. Uh, RAS actually did a survey with consumers asking about how their habits have changed. Um, and interestingly, 25% of people we asked thought they, have, they're in, they had increased how much they're using, but 32% have made a conscious effort to actually reduce their um, usage as well. So people, people are thinking a bit about water. So moving on to the next slide. So what could we do to save water or waste less? I'm not sure this is really rocket science. Um, if we want to use less, well, we can use uh, water efficient products that use less water. We could think about alternative water sources uh, for some tasks, and we could try and change habits uh, and behavior. I think if you design efficiency in with water efficient products, that's probably easier than changing behavior, but they've probably all got a role to play. If we think about wasting less, well, we should fit compliant fittings uh, that don't leak. That sounds like a good idea. We should fix faulty fittings um, if, when they begin to leak. And perhaps we could reuse our wastewater as well. So kind of generically, they're sort of it's a very top level things that we could do. Let's have a think about what DEFRA is proposing. So um, DEFRA quite rightly said that there's a twin track approach here. Uh, there's a role for water companies in, in reducing leakage, 
but there's also a role for us as consumers to try and reduce our per capita consumption as well. So they did a consultation on that topic. And these are the kind of key themes that DEFRA were proposing some action uh, that the UK government wanted to lead in terms of policy. Reducing leakage, including supply pipes, that makes sense because 25% of leakage is to do with the consumer's own pipe work. Um, they're thinking about a change in building regulations. And there's a lot of debate about perhaps a water fittings approach rather than using a water calculator uh, uh, to reduce usage to 110 litres. So quite a lot of debate about how building regulations might be used. There's definitely some attention and thought about water efficiency labelling. So it's fantastic that we've got Yvonne here uh, today who's going to tell us much more about that. Metering and smart metering, again, a bit like the labelling is giving consumers good information so they can make really good choices. Then they've had a whole section on communication, on behaviour change uh, and incentives. In fact, I was just reading about some really interesting work that was going on with the United Utilities who were incentivising people to use less to earn money for a charity just quite recently and had good success. And finally, they've talked about rainwater harvesting uh, and water reuse. So all quite interesting ideas. Um, DEFRA, I know, uh, were expecting to publish their proposals, having done that consultation uh, this autumn, but actually we're just now hearing in the last few days um, that because of Brexit um, and because of COVID, that they're having to reprioritise their efforts. So they're likely to put this off in terms of early 2021 when they'll be looking at this again. So I think we're going to have to wait with bated breath for that. So I think that's right, Tim, you can move on. That's, that's good. Um, however, we do have the water fittings regulations and bylaws and can they help? So moving on. So let's just work out what they are to start off with. Well, the water fittings and regulations and bylaws are, are in the UK. They're slightly different um, by country uh, in the UK. Uh, they've been around for 20 years uh, in their entirety um, and they aim to, to prevent contamination. So uh, your water is safe to drink. Um, secondly, not to waste water and therefore get rid of leakage. Um, that you shouldn't misuse the water. So you shouldn't use some, uh, something for the purposes uh, that it wasn't intended. Undue consumption is about using way more water than you need for a particular purpose. Uh, and finally, they have erroneous measurement, which is quite a posh word for bypassing your meter and stealing water. But of course, if it's stolen, it's unaccounted for and we'll think that that might be leakage. So if we move on to the next slide. So where do they apply? Well, the water regulations apply. Well, first of all, it has to be water supplied from the public supply by a water company. So that does count for the vast majority of water that's supplied uh, in the UK. Um, they cover the design, uh, installation, and operation of water fittings, and they cover pipes, taps, boilers, uh, water using appliances, um, and everything in between. So they have quite, quite a broad range, but they only apply at the boundary of the premise. So they don't cover those assets that are owned by the water companies themselves. So we know a little bit about them. How can they help? Well, I've got four solutions here in terms of how the water fittings regulations can already help with this challenge in terms of using less water or saving water. Well, first and foremost, all products must be a suitable quality and standard. So a really straightforward solution here is to choose compliant products which have been tested so they don't leak. So we just move on to the next slide. So all taps are, um, all uh, water fittings are supposed to be tested before they're installed to show that they won't leak to make sure that the materials won't uh, contaminate. Um, and so you might assume that if you went into a shop and picked something off the shelf, that it would have passed all of these tests so that you wouldn't become a criminal by installing it if it didn't meet those uh, standards and requirements. Now, this slide um, is some work that Yvonne and I uh, did when Yvonne was back at the BMA, and we talked to a number of manufacturers in this case, it's a snapshot. So we've got manufacturers who are uh, manufacturers that produce uh, shower fittings as well. And we asked them for all of the products that you're selling, what percentage of your range is compliant, i.e. you've tested? Interestingly, if you look at the bottom end, around half of them said quite a big proportion of their range was compliant, 76 to 100 percent. But that meant the other half didn't have completely compliant ranges or less than 75% or even worryingly, no percentage of their range that was compliant. 
So that's kind of, that's a, a really sort of surprising and interesting dilemma. And I think that's probably quite a good point, Tim, to introduce our second poll. So the, the reality is, is that not all products you buy at the supermarket may have been tested and may not be compliant. So I think in the second poll, if you can find it, Tim, is really a question about, do you think that uh, shops and online re retailers should only sell pipes, taps and plumbing fittings, which meet the UK water fittings regulations? So hopefully this is a slightly easier question. You can either say yes, no, or don't know. Uh, I know what I'm putting uh, if I'm not leading you and we'll, uh, we'll just wait for some of those results to come back. Interestingly, as you might expect, we've done a little bit of survey work on this ourselves. Um, uh, and so we know what consumers think uh, or what their expectations might be uh, in terms of that as well. So we'll just give it a few more seconds uh, and hopefully, ah, here we go. Great, I love you all. So 97% of you are saying yes. Um, you do expect something that you buy off the shelf should be compliant with the, uh, the water fittings regulations. We've got 1% who don't know and 1% uh, who say no. Uh, so that's more controversial then. So if we kind of move on to the second slide and the next, no, the next slide. So I'd like you to choose compliant products that have been tested. So you might need to ask the question because it's not always obvious. The second thing is, well, let's exclude some high water use products. Um, and we do have the concept of uh, undue consumption here that might help. And quite specifically, let's choose products that use less water. So if we move on, the water fittings regulations, I have to admit here, aren't that helpful. Certainly they limit water use in toilets to a six litre flush or less or dual, uh, dual flush. And I think that was actually extremely successful uh, in terms of a principle of reducing those uh, flushing levels. Although there have been some more controversial issues with uh, whether those uh, issues are now uh, leaking. I think where the regulations have been less helpful are particularly in the domestic washing machines, washing dryers and dishwashers. So these are types of fittings where they've excluded quite high water use. But really, there are, you know, there, there, there were very few products that use that much water. And of course, because they've outlawed, the kind of machines have got much, much better and uh, manufacturers have made fantastic improvements in terms of efficiency. And so the limits that are set in these regulations are extremely out of date. So the other bit to consider, and I guess hooking into uh, uh, Yvonne's presentation that's coming up, is we have the unified uh, water label. So Again, it's not part of the regulations, but it is certainly as it stands a good label in terms of giving consumers uh, more information. I guess the big challenge uh, from DEFRA and from water companies is that it would be great if that was mandatory so that you saw it on every single machine um, because we're not seeing enough of the water label. It's, it's uh, making great strides, but we'd like to see a lot more of it. So moving on. So thirdly, uh, the regulations actually require Things to be installed in a workmanlike manner. So that uh, how you could do something in a workmanlike manner is, for example, install something in uh, in line with a British standard. So something like BS uh, 806 uh, would be a way of demonstrating that something is in a workmanlike -like manner, or perhaps a, an approved installation method. So a real simple solution to this is perhaps to use an approved contractor, which are set out by the regulations. So if we just move to the next slide. Why might not operating in a workmanlike manner be a problem? Well, I borrowed this rainwater harvesting case study from one of the uh, UK water companies. And I'm very grateful for it. Uh, in this case, the water company inspected 1,200 properties with rainwater harvesting uh, installed. So these were all new build properties um, and they were notified. The water company inspected them and actually made sure that every single one of them was compliant when they were connected. So that made uh, that makes a lot of sense. But because they're considered a high risk um, unit, because they're using fluid category five, that they reinspected them every two years during a five year period. And it's just as well they did, because what they found over that five year period is that by the time they got to the end, 70% failed to comply. Now, I found that quite shocking. And a third of those were due to a cross connection. Uh, and of course, if that's in the open position, um, that's water from your roof that the birds have pooed in, coming straight to your kitchen tap. So that's certainly a concern about the quality of installers. And actually, in this case, is talking about actually how things are maintained and where changes may have been made a bit later. So if you move to the next slide, then the approved contractors are have got a particular legal status 
within the water fittings regulation and uh, water safe is a collection of the seven approved contractor schemes in the uk so this is backed uh, by water companies uh, and the drinking water quality regulators and it essentially vets plumbers to make sure that they've got basic qualifications and there's certainly qualifications in the water fittings regulations uh, as well so it gives a better choice uh, of approved plumbers uh, because actually anybody even i could set up as a plumber even if I have no qualifications to do, to do them. So I think WaterSafe gives a much better choice for consumers. So moving on to the next slide, I come on to perhaps the fourth and probably shouldn't be interest, underestimated is probably one of the most important aspects of the regulations. Fittings must not waste water. So it's not okay if they're leaking and actually we've got a duty to fix leaky pipes uh, and fittings. So moving to the next slide. So, you might, you've guessed it, we've done another survey and we actually asked consumers, thinking back to the last five years, uh, what problems have you had with your plumbing? Uh, and so these are the top answers. And so kind of interesting, the top answer was actually a dripping tap. And then we had 11% with a leaky pipe, 10% with a slower clogged drain, 9% with a running toilet and 9% with a water pressure issue. But three of those top five answers are actually all about leaks. And actually when we asked people a bit more it's quite clear that some people, because there's only a drip or a little bit of water, or haven't really noticed it, put off those jobs and there's a tremendous amount of water that can actually be lost. So if we move the slide on. So I guess to conclude, um, actually my solutions for water efficiency, so saving water and using less water is, let's actually just get the basics right first and foremost. So these aren't probably the sexiest of solutions, but they're definitely things that will help significantly. First of all, let's just choose compliant products which have been tested so they don't leak. Let's choose products that use less water. Use an approved contractor, not just for the installation, but for how things are maintained. And finally, let's fix those leaky pipes, leaky loos and fittings. So if I've sort of whetted your appetite um, to know a little bit more about the regulations. So my last slide is just how to contact us. So we do have a telephone number and we have a website and we have a newsletter as well. So if you want to get some more news on the regulations, we would love to hear from you. So thanks very much. And back to Richard. Thanks very much, uh, <clears throat> Julie. A big round of applause. And I dare say that you can hear the applause coming down the line uh, from all over the country and overseas. Uh, firstly, might just uh, apologise if I may have <laughs> gave the wrong years. That was a uh, do apologise for that. However, what we need to do now is we're getting plenty of questions in, but we'll leave them till the end of um, Yvonne's um, presentation, if we may. Um, but there are uh, quite a number coming in. So I'm sure Tim is trying to put them into a list and we'll answer as many as possible. And just to point here, any questions that you put on, if we don't get to them during the uh, discussion um, section, then there will be an answer to all and they will be put on the uh, on our websites, et cetera, as I mentioned earlier. So once again, uh, uh, Judy, a uh, big thank you uh, very much. So we're gonna move on to Yvonne now, who's the uh, M MD of the Unified Water Label. And uh, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background uh, on Yvonne, if I may. Yvonne is at over 30 years, I emphasize 30 years experience in the UK bathroom industry, and is well recognized as a leader and influencer. She's held the position of Chief Executive of the Bathroom Manufacturers Association, the BMA, uh, between 2006, uh, 22, 2006 to 2019. Yvonne is a current MD, as I've mentioned, in the Unified Water Label, a non-exec board member of the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom, Bathroom Installation, as well as uh, uh, a uh, non-exec on the uh, National Home Improvement Council. Um, well, wow. uh, Yvonne, I uh, hope I've given you a good uh, build up and uh, we'll look forward to your uh, presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. And uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you for sparing your, the time this evening to, to join the autumn lecture, which I'm thrilled to be participating in it. I'm relying heavily on Tim Sainty from CIPHE, who's our technical uh, support tonight. So hopefully uh, between us, we'll get the slides through as quickly as possible so that we can spend an awful lot of time discussing the elements of, of the, the two presentations. Um, moving on, Tim. 
Okay, the agenda that I should be talking about this evening is what, what are the drivers of water efficiency? And I know Julie has mentioned uh, a number of them, but I'm gonna uh, reinforce some of those uh, aspects. Uh, the challenges, uh, I'm a firm believer that one solution is not the complete answer. Highlighting our learnings from a variety of research uh, that's been undertaken over the years, what action has been taken? Um, what is the unified water label? for those of you who don't know, and towards the end of the presentation, what role that we should all be playing, not just uh, reliant on one party. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, but to start with, um, these are three quotes uh, that I think are very relevant to why water efficiency is so important. So from the United Nations, water is at the core of sustainability and is critical for socioeconomic development healthy ecosystems and for human survival itself. And I think that's the important factor we mustn't forget. It is vital for reducing the global burden of disease and improving the health, welfare and productivity of populations. And I think we're experiencing some of that uh, sanitation aspects with the current pandemic. Uh, looking at what the World Health Organization says, it's a basic human right to access water, and yet a third of the global population does not have direct access to clean water. And I think the most important fact that we all use on a regular basis, I hear it so many times, water is life, without it, we die. And that's plants and everything else. So come on, we need to stop wasting the water. Um, we haven't got an infinite supply, we have a finite supply, and do we have to be more innovative? and use water wisely. So the challenges of finding that balance. So what are the market challenges? We have a diverse population with many requirements across multiple demographics. And I think we have to recognize here that choice is important. Um, I know that we have to reduce waste, but we also have to recognize that people are in dirty industries, that uh, the elderly and people with dexterity issues need more water uh, at certain times of their life. Choice is important for business and for the consumers, and we mustn't forget that. But we have to find that balance, um, but we have to deliver, uh, the product has to deliver no less performance, otherwise customers is dissatisfied and the installers at the front of the coal face. Um, so that dissatisfaction is targeted at you. Do apologize, I'll put my teeth in next time. We have a duty to educate the consumer via a simple, honest and credible label. With every challenge comes an opportunity. And these are the opportunities that I've uh, identified, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are many, many more. Uh, industry is leading by example. Uh, we have a wealth of expertise that brings to market products that underpin corporate social responsibility. When I talk about industry, I don't just mean the manufacturers, I mean the installers, the merchants and the retailers, as well as manufacturers. Water using bathroom products are part of a system and are not standalone products. If we master of our own destinies, because we are the experts, and we have to find market solutions that dovetail with, in Europe, the renovation wave, and in the UK, the green agenda. And then we have the circular economy, and we have a whole bag of other challenges that the presentation's only 20 minutes, so I haven't gone into too much detail in that direction. Moving on. So what are the drivers? Well, there are many political drivers uh, via uh, eco-design, um, the Environment Bill in the UK, which Julie has already identified, um, is being put on hold until next year due to COVID and what have you. But there are a number of green stimulus packages that will benefit us all if we actually look for them. And the UK government is no different than global governments in treading this uh, political path with the uh, all sorts of things coming on board um, and we will see a, a raft of additional measures being introduced uh, via the uh, environmental bill which will give the government the framework to implement but that's not just for water efficiency in terms of consumer and the domestic market it is also uh, 
encouraging and giving legal targets on fixing leaks. Um, Julie's mentioned fixing leaks on product, but fixing leaks in the piping system and infrastructure. So we all have a role to play going forward. Now, it's not just governments. It is people like United Nations with their 17 uh, sustainable goals. Number six is clean water and sanitation. And number nine is about industry innovation and infrastructure. And these align with national government strategies to influence change. Okay, Tim, thanks. Um, we're all fully aware of hands face space and the COVID-19 message, but we talk about mixed messages in the marketplace. So we have to wash our hands in hot soapy water for 20 seconds. So sing happy birthday to yourself. Uh, twice, uh, wear a mask to cover nose and mouth and protect oneself and others. And we have to social distance. But I found this video on um, John Hopkins University's website. Um, we've lost the sound to it due to the complexity of uh, virtual platforms. But listen to it and then we'll talk about it. So that's how we are supposed to wash our hands. Every crevice, that's how you wash hands in a hospital. Make sure we get into those fingernails. Okay, Tim, we can cut the video short now because it's only going over what we've already done. Back to the presentation and moving to the next slide. Okay, for those of you watching the video, um, there are two important factors here. The important role of how to wash your hands correctly because of COVID, but that tap was running the whole time through that video. So for every uh, time you wash your hands and you are leaving the tap running to waste, is this an action that we must do? Is it necessary? I'm asking you guys the question because I don't think it is, but hey, um, it does come back to using less water, maintaining health and safety and reducing wastewater. However, it's not a simple solution that is required but an effective solution, and that we all must play a role in identifying and achieving it. Decades have gone by where society has become wasteful, along with poor infrastructure, inferior product, bad install, wrong product, fit and forget mentality of consumers, no maintenance, all of which impact on increasing unnecessary water wastage. And if we look at the questions that are coming through, uh, both through Julie's presentation and mine, um, Professional install base is, is the foundation of all this. If we don't get that right, then we may as well all pack up and go home now because we ain't achieving anything. How we move forward collectively is crucial. And if we are to achieve the environmental goal, we have to work together. Slide nine, that's right. So uh, I alluded to it at the very beginning of my presentation that research has been done. 13% um, of water used in the UK is in the domestic environment. I know Julie's covered some of this, but it's interesting to know that the World Bank suggests that 70% of the world water is used for agriculture. And if you remember back to Julie's slide, it's only 3% that we have access to, of which 0.5% is only pot is clean fresh water. 20% for industry and 10% is in the domestic um, market. So 13% is not too far away from it. So the UK water used per capita, including agriculture and industry, we sit 43rd in the world rankings um, with 348 litres per person. 
Now, if we look at countries such as Germany, Croatia and Poland, they are heavy industrial and manufacturing countries. So they are using 855 litres per capita. So is the UK doing OK? Well, I'm not so sure it is. Um, consumer research also shows um, that was taken, uh, their research was undertaken two years ago, that consumers run a shower to warm up between one and five minutes, with the most being over 20 minutes. The same research identified that the average shower time is 10.7 minutes compared to the EU study on taps and showers as seven minutes. So even the statistics aren't aligning themselves, um, but one fact is, is sure, there's a tremendous amount of water that is used by individual households that could be reduced, not by product, but by behavior change. So slide 10, Manufacturers have already realized the commercial potential and introduced a plethora of products, and you will have all seen these uh, as you, you uh, undertake your day-to-day -day work, that will help to achieve goals on water and energy, which will, re will result in carbon emission reductions. So water, energy and carbon are inextricably linked. Greater visibility of the unified water label, which has already been called for, and incentive to stimulate sales of these products could see a water and associated any reduction of 21% by 2050. Reducing shower time just by one minute each can reduce the water and energy by as much as 7%. So if we can encourage consumers to use only one less minute on their shower, then we will have already achieved the 7% reduction. So environmental savings through innovation drives market transformation, and that is exactly what manufacturers are doing today. Today's products deliver the experience but use less. Channels to market also have an important role to play. Yesterday's practices need refining to meet tomorrow's environmental needs, and I'm not 100% confident that they are. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. Recent consumer research identified that consumers seek efficiency information and guidance on right product, but it's often not forthcoming. The CIPHE undertook research on behalf of the uh, Unified Water Label uh, within the last few months with the findings hot off the press that identified that one in three have seen an increase in consumers asking about efficiency and only one in four have heard of the Unified Water Label. Collectively, we can do better. So small steps can make a huge difference um, in reducing household carbon emissions. Currently at 18% of the total UK emissions. Great opportunities, don't let's miss out. 13. So, if one in four of you have only heard of the label, I thought I'd better take this opportunity to tell you what it's all about. The bathroom industry has developed a unique voluntary labeling scheme that represents about 65% of products sold in the marketplace. It's not just bathrooms, kitchen taps are also included. It's a simple, honest label that age choice at point of selection. Its primary metric is water. The scheme is growing and is currently supported by 160 well-known manufacturing brands, 40 additional supporters from environmentalists, trade and consumer media, related trade bodies and installer organizations such as CIPHE, that pin, underpinned with a database of just under 13,000 individual products. This is split of 38% of that database is sanitary wear, 37 is taps, including kitchen, and 18% is showers. So you can see the three bad boys of the industry are, are reflected in the split on the database. The infograph, moving on to the next slide, is a quick glance on the development journey and market activity of the unified water label. Uh, it is uh, right across Europe. Uh, we do see it on uh, over 50% of the uh, manufacturing websites, product literature. We see it on installation guides, and we also see it in some shops. Um, so it is growing. It does need a little bit more uh, momentum behind it and people need to start promoting it. Uh, the label has seen growth right across Europe, seen high coverage in consumer and trade media and regularly used by over 10,000 architects and specifiers to identify water using uh, products. 
So what next for the unified water label? Well, it's exciting as it's been unleashed as it moves its base from the Bathroom Manufacturers Association to the newly formed Unified Water Label Association, formerly the European Bathroom Forum, do apologise for all the acronyms, with an elected board from all sectors of the industry. There are currently two vacant positions on that board if anybody's interested in driving this voluntary initiative forward. The new association and inaugural meeting will take place the 2nd of December and will be via virtual platform, so no trips abroad. Sorry. Next one. But that's not all. The scheme is part of a progressive action being undertaken. Government has committed to legal net zero homes target by 2050. And although on course, there are many that think it's unachievable. New homes are built following strict building regulations that address the need for greater environmental measures, including water. The building regulations are constantly kept relevant and updated to reflect market transformation and 2021 could see the move for Part G to only be a fittings approach with limits on which water flow products are allowed as Julie has already identified. However, the challenge is the existing homes and buildings that currently are out there in the marketplace and they need improvements and require substantial investment and refurbishment. Homes account for 18% of carbon emissions, plus 15% of carbon emissions come from electricity. Consumers are only now connecting the link between water and energy and carbon. Many do not even know how much water they use, as Julie's already indicated, let alone the associated energy or carbon. And I see it that this is where we can all take a piece of the responsibility, influence and educate. The planned environment bill delayed until next year will influence change and improvements from water utilities, reduce waste targets and labelling playing a more prominent role. And the call for smart tools to help reach these goals, exactly what the unified water label was developed for. An average seven minute shower used daily can use over 5,000 litres of water per person per year. However, research shows that showering times fluctuate from four to 27 minutes plus warm up time, um, which can be as much as 20 minutes because the bathroom then becomes a sauna. The European Commission study indicates that the in use phase is where change must happen. Product exists, the label exists, identifying water, energy and carbon to influence behavior change, but it's the swapping out of the old guzzlers for new that is now required, stimulating the market. Cohesive messaging is also required. Bring a halt to mixed messaging as the video showed earlier in the presentation and working together to achieve the goal, not a paper exercise, but achieving the goal in reality. Researchers also identified that consumers are seeking out this information and install as the main influencer in product choice can lead. It's a balancing act influencing choice, not being overbearing to your customer that you lose the project. But if we don't work together, then we may see restriction that drives consumer dissatisfaction and they move their attention to find products via the Internet from who knows where, whether they're compliant and what the materials are. So we're moving on to a question um, that you uh, need to answer through the chat, I believe, Tim. So do you support the ideology to restrict the sale and installation of products? with high flow? Quite simple, yes or no. Oh, there you go. You can fill in a, a simple chart online. So when we collate the, the responses received, I'm sure Tim will put the slide up so we can see. We've got an awful lot of questions coming through on the uh, Q&A section as well as the chat. So 78% say yes, we should restrict the amount of uh, flow in products that are available in the marketplace. 16% uh, say no and 6% say don't know. That's really uh, interesting uh, to uh, look at the fact that you believe that we should restrict uh, and that you face the dissatisfaction of the customer. Um, let's see how we progress going forward. 
uh, slide 19. So what is the Unified Water Label doing? Um, it's partnered with a leading carbon consultant with the first phase seeing the development of a carbon calculator, principal metric, one litre of water into the home. The carbon calculator complements the water will see the development to calculate carbon from one litre of water leaving the home. The manufacturing process has not been included. We're on a journey and we have to take it step by step and we have to take the consumer and the rest of the industry with us. The calculators will be uh, available for you to use um, through the website, which is currently being rebuilt, and they should be ready by the end of November, beginning of December. So why have we got calculators? Well, they're part of the solution. They play. They have so far, the water calculator has played a, a role in over 150,000 projects and is used extensively by architects and specifiers on a daily basis. I am constantly speaking with architects in uh, Ireland, right across the UK, in Scotland and in Wales, and also in Europe um, of how to use the calculator that's linked to the database of products. In addition to the water calculator, we have the energy calculator, which is, can you go back one, Tim? <laughs> He's getting ahead of me. Is that a message to say, hurry up, Yvonne? <clears throat> the energy calculator is based on the MEOP study of taps and showers and is only relevant to taps and showers where hot water is used. And the carbon is right across uh, the uh, spectrum of products. So an example, and this is only an example, so please, don't, don't uh, beat me up about uh, it's not exact. There are 27 million homes in the UK. So each home's got two taps uh, and doing the comparison of a 13 litre tap against a six litre tap uh, used one, twice a day for one minute each. That's 13 litre tap uses 9,490 9, litres of water per annum and generates 10 kilograms of carbon emissions. The six litre tap uses probably just just less than half, so 5,110 litres, and saves 5.4 kilograms of carbon emissions. So overall, the, the six litre tap can save 138 billion litres of water per year and 145,000 tonnes of CO2s. And that's the equivalent of 3.7 million barrels of oil. These are the uh, consultants calculations, not mine. A considerable amount of water, energy and carbon is to be saved if the product is used correctly and not over exhausted by consumer intervention. If you have more showers per day, you will use more water, more energy and generate more carbon. OK. So once you've used the calculators, the infographic then is uh, automatically generated for you to have them, those comparables on, on that form. Um, this is all free, so you can use it to your heart's content when they go live later in, the, uh, later in November. So what is now required? We need consumers to drive refurbishment projects with efficiency at their core decision process. We need manufacturers to deliver products to the marketplace with the unified water label uh, swing ticket attached to the product. Uh, products need to be installed by somebody who knows what they are doing. Get it right first time. And water utilities to repair the infrastructure and plug them leaks. This gives the consumer the right message that they are doing their bit. And now come on, Mrs. Consumer, you've got to do yours. And consumers need to recognize, as Julia's already identified, product maintenance. We don't manufacture products that are fit and forget. And more importantly, and finally, the government must act as the glue that brings this together and incentivizes the replacement market. Moving on, Tim. So what does the future hold? Firstly, it's not going away. I've outlined the political drivers and I hope you recognize that it's not going away. Innovation is the link between design performance, use less resource material. We need to design and install for deconstruct, recycle and repairability. We need to work together, partnerships. We, we are the solution collectively. We need to identify practical solutions that will work in practice not just paper exercise. We need to have cohesive messaging initiatives 
And we need to understand customer expectations, not what we think they want, but what they actually need. And we need to recognize that change takes a generation and will not happen overnight. So using your chat button, which you've been doing uh, quite a lot over the last two presentations, which initiative do you propose to influence change that will reduce water wastage? And the final slide. Environmental change is here and happening. Let's embrace it and take the commercial advantage by working together to find the solution. Thank you for listening and back to Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Yvonne. Uh, can I give you a virtual uh, um, clap, please? Thanks very much indeed. Wonderful presentation. We're just a few minutes out, but I think between the two of you, between uh, Julie and Yvonne, it was spot on. Uh, and what it's done is created an incredible amount of questions. In fact, I think, uh, and I know Tim is li listening uh, avidly, um, we are over 60 questions, plus we had some pre-questions from people who wrote in asking them. So we're going to move straight into it straight away. Tim, you're taking over now with regard to you've done some prioritization on questions for Yvonne and um, Julie. So could I pass over the uh, first question to you to ask, please? Uh, Richard, if, if I, because I've been controlling the um, presentations, I haven't looked through them yet. You've got the ones that have been submitted in advance. If you could um, do a couple of those whilst I have a look through the questions now on my screen. Thank you. OK, uh, I'll take over. Thanks very much for that. I, I realised a lot was going on. So first of all, if we could, uh, Yvonne, um, if we could just start off with a, one of the written questions and then we'll ask one also for uh, Julie as well. Given the importance of water in safeguarding, the health of the public and the need for water saving appliances and fittings, what more do you think should be done to ensure that those involved in plumbing and sanitation installations are qualified, experienced and competent? Well, Richard, if we look at the wider picture, water has lost in huge amounts due to lack of infrastructure investment, poor installation and non-compliant products, all what Julie said and what I've said in the presentations. So we have to start at the beginning. Um, we have to have a professional install and we need to be looking at the colleges, um, not grandfather rights or anything else. We need to start back from basics. Um, I know a lot of the questions that are coming through are talking about grey and rain and black water use. But if we haven't got the installation base to install these products, then we are just generating further issues for the health and safety of the UK nation. I'm a firm believer that we need a professional install basis and we need to get back in them colleges and make sure that Julie can't be a plumber tomorrow. <laughs> Very wise, Yvonne. Have you, have you got, uh, uh, Julie, have you got any additional comments you'd like to make on that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think getting the right installers is so important. Um, I, I think the kind of the experience, the feedback I hear where we have kind of particular water quality problems, quite often, this is to do with people who are installing or, or people who are, people just don't see water as dangerous. Um, you know, it looks good, it smells good. And therefore, you know, anyone's quite happy to have a go and sort of change a tap. But even a simple thing like installing uh, a washing machine, using an unapproved hose, very common to get sort of taste and odor problems from that. Actually, somebody who's qualified would know that you should get a compliant hose and actually you should always have a, a single check valve and it'll just stop the water going in the wrong direction. And so actually there's some quite basic things that people are, are, are not going right. And I think that um, case study I had from a water company with a rainwater harvesting says actually, you know, I, I am absolutely firm believer that re, uh, reuse rainwater harvesting are, are, are very kind of important parts of the equation, but my goodness, we've got some work to raise the standards uh, within the plumbing industry. And there's a lot of people who are unqualified out there giving really good plumbers who've taken the trouble to get qualified, who've been mentored, who understand the water regulations, um, and they need to be able to stand out from those people as well. But, you know, unfortunately, there's loads of work out there. Um, and so we need to help people sort of make better choices or give them the information so that they can. Thanks very much. Just going back a little bit to your rain uh, to rainwater harvesting uh, systems. Um, 
The reference was made at 70% rainwater harvesting systems failing um, reinspection within five years, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously is alarming. Um, could, uh, could this indicative or a wider non-compliance issue across the UK, would mandated training on water regulations bylaws for all those involved with installation and maintenance of systems improve this? What else do you suggest needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's really quite a good suggestion. I mean, quite interestingly on that case study, it wasn't the first time installers and actually because they were new homes, quite a lot of changed hands. People didn't know what they had in their homes. So this is kind of why mistakes are making uh, are being made. But absolutely, I think uh, not having a professional mandatory register of plumbers is a mistake um, in this country. I'm a big fan of the gas safe register. It doesn't answer all of the ills, but making sure that people have actually past basic qualifications seems important. We're sort of taking our, our water and protecting it, you know, absolutely for, for granted. And if you install something incorrectly, you know, it's not only sort of risking contamination, but again, you're much more likely to have leaks and problems created. And that's uh, not just wasting water, but can be terribly damaging uh, for people as well. So a very, a very worrying case study, which uh, I'm sure that that would be repeated in, in, uh, in, in other homes where they've had rainwater harvesting installed. So it's a real worry. Uh, the, it's a worry. the second thing I think, which, which RAS did get a change in standards for is uh, we did uh, successfully ask BSI to update its standards in terms of how pipes are marked. <laughs> um, because that, being able to see that you're tapping into something that isn't wholesome water is quite important as well. But um, you know whether people are applying the standards just because they're there is, a, is another matter. Um, you need enforcement as well as standards, I think, being set. Yeah, if I may say the enforcement, we know in certain other countries there is that if you make any changes or amendments to a system in the domestic or commercial, it has to be signed off uh, by the building control. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one to take forward. Tim, uh, we've had an unbelievable amount of questions <laughs> coming in. And I think it's only, it's only good that we should get some from, uh, you know, our attendees uh, who've been obviously listening and i'm yeah. sure you've got a couple of questions now to go forward with i have and um i want one not a million miles away from what you were just discussing actually but um do you think that water regulations really are in need of an update in order to regulate them with new technologies and to ensure that they uh, comply with uh, required regulations mm, that's a really interesting question they've been around they've had their sort of 20 year anniversary now and actually Quite a lot of it is good, basic, um, practical uh, common sense. And actually quite a lot of them are fine, but there are some elements that definitely need to be updated and things around water efficiency don't make sense. And I think there's a bit of a debate about whether there might be an idea to update parts of the water regulations or building regs, and they need to complement and, and say similar things, I, I think. Probably the bits that are clunky with the, the water fittings regulations are particularly about testing standards um, and uh, conformity tests that are the regulator specification, because actually they're really out of date. They've never been updated and they don't keep up to date with innovative products. And, you know, when we're talking about water efficiency type uh, activities, they're much more likely to be a barrier. Um, they're much more likely to prohibit something than actually give some simple tests to prove something that works. So, yes, I think there are definitely some elements of the water regulations that are, are due for a review. Tim, can okay. I come in on that one? Yeah? Yes, please. please, please right, thank okay. you. Regulations are brilliant. They, they drive innovation to a certain extent. But without robust market surveillance and a professional installer base, then you may as well write the regulations on toilet paper and flush it down <laughs> the loo and waste another seven, six litres of water. Because... These are the issues. These are the big gaping holes that we have to address and we have to be more forceful to get this across. And, and this is sort of my 20, 30 years with the BMA coming out here. Um, regulations play a part, but they are not the solution. They really are not. And we have to collectively come together for a better educated professional installer base. I think that leads quite nicely to um, a question that is repeated in different forms. So I'll take, I'll take it from one, which is, um, we need to gain protected status for plumbers so that it is only plumbers that can work on the supplies. And by that, I'm assuming, of course, then that is referring to 
competent, identifiable, competent plumbers. And so, so where is the collective push on this front? Do you want yeah. me to start? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there feels like there's much appetite um, by the government now. They're, they're obviously distracted with Brexit and with COVID um, sort of uh, quite understandably. And there's certainly, uh, I think, an appetite uh, from RAS. I know with CIPHE and others that this is something that we're, we're sort of quite interested in, in, in seeing sort of being moved forward. Um, and so it's, I, I suspect that it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve, which I, which I think is, is quite disappointing. Um, the Worshipful Company of Plumbers, 650 years, the original register uh, of plumbers. You'd think that we'd have got a lot better by this point. If, if I could just, if I could make a comment, Julie, as uh, being both uh, co liverymen you know, the one thing which is very important into the future is safe water is life. And I emphasize the word safe. Have you got any additional comments to make, uh, Yvonne, before we move to the next question? I think it's just reiterating what's been said and what's certainly coming out in the chat is that if we are moving into the grey and rain and black and what any other colour you want to call the water, then we will drive without a professional installer base, we will drive the waterborne diseases uh, further in and put strain onto our already broken NHS. And, and this is not something that I would support at all until we get those foundations right. Sorry to keep beating about it, but it's so important. Back to you, Tim. No, thank you. I'm enjoying myself here and I'm going to throw in a throw in a curveball because I can. Um, <laughs> which, is, which is as an island, how how realistic is it to desalinate in order to increase supply? Open to both. It's very easy to desalinate. Um, a lot of countries do it, but we have a legal target of uh, net zero carbon and we will drive carbon up the wrong way. Um, a high energy using for uh, desalination plants. But it's not something that I would support. As an island, we need to find more practical solutions, not huge investment into the wrong areas. Yeah, I, I mean, I support that. It's uh, incredibly expensive. Um, it uses lots of energy um, and uh, it's not a good way to spend consumers' work money in general. I think there are some limited circumstances, depending on supply and demand, where it might well be um, maybe justified. And I know there have been a little bit of work on some of uh, the crown dependencies. Um, and in some of the islands where actually that probably is the best solution for those, but in general, um, it's a much better idea to try and use less water to, to tackle leakage, um, which I think has come up on the chat, um, as it is, it is a much more sustainable end, I think, really. But, but there are places where desalination should, should play a role for sure. But in general, probably not for the UK. OK, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling back. Um, there was, there was a question, I'm, I'm trying to find it again, and I've lost it momentarily. Ah, here we go. But from where do the 140 to 150 litres of usage come? Is this extrapolated from metered household consumption? And can you confirm this does not include non-DOM process, industrial and retail consumption divided Absolutely. by the population? Yeah. So I've borrowed it and you can find it yourself on the WaterWise website. So it's from research uh, that's been done by water companies. Uh, and it is only domestic use. Um, and so the, the, the figures vary. There's some figures that Environment Agency have done uh, separately as well. So it isn't sort of taking the whole metered use and dividing it by per capita. It's just looking at uh, domestic use. And interesting, if you remember from Yvonne's slides, um, actually domestic use, I think Yvonne had it about 13%. Sometimes I've heard it as about sort of 20%, at least sort of 80 plus percent of water use is actually um, in commercial uh, as well. So uh, not for domestic use as well. So there's there's a lot of water used in, in industry. Okay, and just to follow on from that, a related question, if I may, and again, an acknowledgement of what Richard said earlier on, we will follow up with written responses where we haven't been able to get to questions here, but um, Amanda Stanley has asked, should, should we not aim at 2030 targets for 
50% reduction of domestic use at 75 litres and commercial at 10 litres per person per day. They'll be more aggressive in the targets that are being set. Well, I mean, it's interesting to hear that because when DEFRA did their consultation, they were talking about 110 litres, 100 litres, um, yeah. I've, I've heard. Um, and, and listening to a work, a follow-up workshop they had in, uh, in August, uh, DEFRA was saying that overwhelm, you know, there's a kind of overwhelming response from people to their research that said, you are not ambitious, we should be driving it uh, more. Um, yeah. And it must, it, must, it must be doable, but I think there's quite a lot of work to do. You know, in my mind, let's get design right and kind of design things uh, out so you don't have to think about it. But there's quite, there's a massive behaviour change piece, really, uh, as well as giving people information. I know on the chat, people are talking about uh, smart meters. Absolutely, as part of DEFRA solution. And there's definitely some fantastic technology that's being developed that can actually you learn your water using habits and tell you if they think there's a leak or something happening or something unusual. So there's some fantastic technology things coming along, which is about giving consumers the information to change their behavior. But if you want to change behavior, you've got to give really relevant information at the point that it's of interest, you know, um, rather than, you know, giving people their meter or consumption like a month after it's happened. You, you need something way more interactive and you need apps and kind of really interesting technology to help with that. I think adding a little bit to what Julie's already said, um, there's so many mixed messaging that's out there. You know, we talk about smart metering. Well, define smart metering. Uh, I don't know of any meter that's out there yet that will tell me whether I've used the toilet too many times or whether I've used the shower too many times or I haven't turned the tap off. And it is all about behavior change. We spent decades telling people don't have a bath, have a shower, and the manufacturers took advantage, implemented uh, better showers that delivered more. And then all of a sudden now it's don't use your shower, back to the bath, or don't have a bath, only have a bath on a Sunday. And then DEFRA come along and say, well, it's not priority anymore. We're pushing it back into next year. There's too many mixed messages. We need to get our focus right, our path right, and we need to collectively be on the same path. Thank you. If people are okay, I'm going to pick out two more questions and allow you to- Tim, <coughs> Tim we'll have to be very quick. We're coming up yeah. to the end of time, please. Um, so um, has, has any thought been given to the uh, reduction in the use of water, which in turn is resulting in the reduction of waste um, exposure which results in a slow flowing drain. How do you manage that issue with using less water? Well, if we look at Germany way back in the 90s, they did water efficiency and then they purged the drains every evening to clean them to make sure that they didn't have block drains, that they didn't have the airborne pathogens that you get in the uh, damp environment. So it's, it's back to what I said, it's finding the practical solution that works in reality. Government is too quick to bring out legislation and practices that do not work in practice. And this is what we've got to change. Well, I did do wastewater investment planning in a previous life, so I ought to have the training for this question, I think. I'm not sure that much thought has gone into it. I suspect if we even achieved 100 litres per capita per person, um, we're probably quite far away from creating too much uh, problems with the drains. There's quite a lot of water going through in many cases. But great question. I think it's exactly what we often miss is that holistic thinking about the unintended consequences of reducing usage and, and what what effect that might have in the network as well. So definitely don't have the answer to that one, but definitely needs to be thought about. And I have to ask this, and I, this will be the final one that I pick out, Richard, um, but it does come up um, on more than one occasion. Um, the reports that around 3 billion litres of water is lost through leaks in mains every day, and that installations and changes in the home are tinkering around the edges whilst whilst that continues and how, how can that be targeted and addressed more effectively yeah. well it's a isn't that just a fair question really as well and, and i think i started with my presentation saying is 
water companies have to play their role in reducing leakage and I think they're they're well aware of that and that's it's good to see some of the information reported by Water UK they're starting to make changes there and actually there are quite mandatory and quite strong regulations coming in to make sure that companies are incentivized um, and I saw an article this morning they've got sniffer dogs for water now as well joining parts of teams and things like that but think about that leakage um, and although the vast majority is of course for the water companies to tackle 24% of that are on the supply pipe that are for the homeowners uh, to tackle and for businesses as well. So there's, I think everybody has to play their role and, and certainly water companies should not be off the hook. I think everybody needs to play, but it isn't insignificant, um, the amount of uh, leakage that happens in the home. I think uh, we, we all need to play our part with that. And I would agree with what Julie's just said. It, we have to find a solution collectively together. Thanks very much, uh, both uh, Julie and uh, Yvonne. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've got one quick question to put up just for reference the uh, the autumn lecture. If uh, Tim, uh, if you could put it up for us, please. For the future. And we'll give a we'll give a little bit of time, but um, as we build up to giving an answer to that before we show it, Tim, can I just, uh, on behalf of the worshipful company of plumbers and uh, all uh, livery people, persons uh, joining this evening, can I do a big, big, big thank you to again uh, to our two presenters, um, Yvonne Orgel and Julie Spinks. Uh, I also want to uh, again uh, a round of applause to uh, Tim uh, mm. for doing the hosting. Uh, absolutely superb job. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, but on behalf of our master of the livery, uh, it's a big, um, it's, it's been a big night for us. And I've just seen now the result come up. So uh, I'm sure at the next uh, uh, meeting of the technical and education committee within the company, uh, we will be uh, looking at uh, moving forward. So here we are, we're just a few minutes late. Uh, the only thing I want to say finally is go back to the craft of our aims and objectives. And under craft, the last one is, is raising the profile for key plumbing developments related to safety, public health, sustainability, and water conservation. Uh, and it's our job within the, um, within the livery, within the worshipful company, is that we can act as an overarching uh, organization a company that can actually support all stakeholders in bringing together for the future of bringing safe water to our country and to the people who live in it. So a big thank you once more. Have a great evening. Uh, be safe. And uh, I'm going to, uh, from the film that was shown, Yvonne, I will now go and make sure I sing happy birthday twice. Robert Burgoyne, if he was on now, he, he taught me that one many years ago. So uh, a, a big thank you to everybody and particularly to the attendees. Thank you for joining. Thanks for the support. And thank you very much for giving us so many things to think about. And you will see it in the press over the coming weeks and also on our websites. Last bit of a thing, please have a look at the Worshipful Company's website. And uh, if you've got any questions at any time, please contact us. Thanks for everybody. Have a nice evening. Cheers now. <laughs>